So let's start by reviewing a lot of the different tools that you learned about in biotechnology. The first one I want to talk about is PCR, which stands for the polymerase chain reaction. And this tool actually just revolutionized molecular biology and the ability to study things at the level of DNA. And the whole idea or purpose of PCR is to make copies of a particular sequence of the of a gene on the on the DNA strand or a particular region of DNA. And we're talking about millions and millions of copies that can be made in a couple of hours. So if let's think of it as we have this little tube, right, um, that our sample is going to be put in. And there are certain ingredients, just like if you're cooking something, that have to be there in order for this reaction to happen. So let's go through. It's actually a really simple process. The first thing is we have to have a template. In other words, this is the DNA that we want to copy. So it could be human DNA, if that's what we're after, or some other organism. Um, so we have to have a template. Next, we have to have the enzyme that's going to actually do the copying. If you'll recall when we talked about DNA replication, so in a cell, because before a cell begins to divide, all the DNA has to be copied. And there's an enzyme that does that naturally called a DNA polymerase. And in PCR, we're making use of a naturally occurring DNA polymerase because that's what a polymerase does in nature. But it's a very specific organism that this DNA polymerase comes from. It comes from an organ, a bacteria called Thermus aquaticus. And this organism lives was was found in the hot springs and the geysers um, at Yellowstone National Park. And so the enzyme, because of the T and the AQ here, is called TAC polymerase. Now why is it such a big deal that this came from this particular bacteria? Well, it's because it's tolerant to high temperatures. And the overall PC re PCR reaction requires changes in temperature in order for things to occur. We're going to go through the temperature changes in just a minute, but I just want to make sure I point out to you that the big deal, why TAC is so important, is because it is not denatured when the temperature is raised to high temperatures. All right, what else do we need? We need primers. So in nature, the cell has to produce primers in order for this enzyme to begin the DNA, the, the production of the new DNA. And primers are necessary for TAC also. The beautiful thing about PCR is that the, the person who's making the copies, the researcher, designs the primers so that that is like the target for this is what I want you to make a copy of. What's between the primers is what is actually copied. What else do we need? The individual nucleotides, so A, C's, G's, T's, all those are necessary, right? So the enzyme has the materials to add them one at a time to the new strand. Now, this is, this is essentially what is necessary for a PCR reaction. Now, as I mentioned to you, um, the, essentially a PCR machine is just a really highly technical thermostat that raises and lowers temperature for a period of time. And let's talk for just a second about why is it that we have a need for changing the temperature. Okay, so what we have to start with, what we show here, is the template. Okay, this is the starting material. What's shown in red is the area that we're interested in making copies of. That's, that's our target sequence we want to copy. So in the PCR machine, the first thing that happens is the temperature is raised. Okay, and why is it raised? Because DNA exists as double-stranded, just like here where we have two strands, 
hydrogen bonded together. When you raise the temperature high enough, it melts the hydrogen bonds, so the DNA becomes single-stranded. Okay, so this high temperature is necessary because the polymerase, the TAC polymerase enzyme, can't begin to make copies of DNA if it's still double-stranded. So the temperature has to raise. And the next thing is the temperature is lowered just a little bit, and this allows the primers that the researcher has designed to find the areas where they're complementary. So shown in green are the primers. So notice these primers are essentially flanking the area that we want to copy. Now we have another temperature change, and in this case the temperature is, is raised to exactly the ideal temperature for TAC polymerase, where it does its most effective synthesizing. And the black line represents new bases that are added one at a time, right? So let's say A here, C here, T here. Whatever the template strand is, the new strand is going to be the complement to that. So it reads each base one at a time and makes the new strand. And remember, with, with replication of DNA, both of the template strands are used as a template. So both of these strands are being synthesized. So at the end of this first cycle, so we began, right, with one double-stranded or two strands of DNA. At the end, now we have four strands. At the end of two cycles, we'll have eight strands. And at the end of three cycles, we'll have two to the fourth power, okay, so it's two times two times 2 times 2, which will be 16 strands. So as each cycle goes forward, we have exponential growth in the number of copies of our target sequence. So for example, after 25 of these cycles, we have just under 70 million copies of our target sequence. Okay, let's shift gears, talk about another tool. Okay, and I want to mention to you restriction enzymes. And so you can think of these as molecular scissors. Okay, so what is their function? They're able to cut the DNA. Now, these are naturally occurring. The whole point of biotechnology, right, is to utilize tools that are naturally occurring but we, we utilize those and manipulate DNA for either research or, um, you know, production of things that help us in medicine, um, help the environment, lots of different things like that. But most of these tools are naturally occurring. Restriction enzymes are produced by bacterial cells, and they're produced as a defense mechanism from foreign DNA, like from viruses that come in to attack their cells. There's many different restriction enzymes, and they all recognize a very specific sequence on the DNA. And each of these sequences is called a palindrome. And I want us to look at a couple of examples. So one of them is ECHOR1. And this is the sequence that it recognizes on double-stranded DNA. So if you imagine we have long strand, right? of double-stranded DNA here, and so I'm only showing you uh, six different base pairs, so there would be some other base pairs there for the remainder of the sequence. The ECHO R1 enzyme comes in, and it cuts between the guanine and the adenine. Okay, so you can see that when that, when that DNA is, is separated, into two strands, this is what it looks like. So we don't have a blunt cut, we have what we call sticky ends or overhangs because we have some bases that are not paired up, okay? Well what does this do? This gives us the ability to cut DNA from two different sources with the same restriction enzyme and they will have the same sticky ends or overhangs. 
Therefore, it's easy to put those pieces of DNA together because their little overhangs or sticky ends are going to match. Now, the other thing I want to point out to you is the sequence of these restriction enzymes is called a palindrome. So look at that here. And in the English language, right, a palindrome is a word that is spelled the same forwards and backwards. But in, in biology, it's sort of like that. Remember that DNA has direction. So let's say that this strand is the 5 prime to 3 prime strand, and this strand is the 3 prime to 5 prime strand. So a palindrome would mean when you're reading it in the 5 to 3 direction, it reads the same. So in other words, this strand 5 to 3, it's G-A-A-T-T-C. This strand reading 5 to 3 is G-A-A-T-T-C. So it has the same sequence. And the cut site is between the same two nucleotides for both direction. So that's an example of one um, restriction enzyme. Let's talk about one more. Okay, this next enzyme is Hindi 3, and this is the site that it recognizes. Okay, and the cut are between is between the two A's. And you can see that again, as you slide those two pieces of DNA apart, there's going to be that little overhang area, which makes it nice to be able to cut two pieces of DNA. So for example, you can cut a gene out of the human genome. So take human DNA, cut one gene or one section of DNA out with a particular enzyme. And then you can cut a plasmid, which is a vector that we can use to make copies of DNA inside of a bacterial cell. You can cut that vector open with the same restriction enzyme and insert the human gene right into the vector. So let's say that, that in green here, this is my um, human DNA. And so on down here, I have another cut site, right? For Hindi 3. Oops. So what I'm interested in is this portion right here, okay, in between those two cut sites. So let's say this is my human DNA. Now let's get us a plasmid. Plasmid is just a circular double-stranded piece of DNA that's not the bacterial chromosome. It's an extra piece of DNA. And let's say that there is a cut site right here for Hindi 3 meaning that it has this sequence, right, A-A-G-C-T-T. So when I cut the plasma with Hindi 3, it's just going to open that up, right? And it's going to have those same single-stranded single sticky ends, okay? So it's going to have T-T-C-G-A here. This is just going to have an A. And on this other end, it's just going to have the A. Oops. Oops, sorry about that. Okay. And this piece in green, okay, this piece right here, this side, you can see is going to come in and fit right here. A, G, C, T, right? And that then will insert this little piece of DNA right here into the plasmid. Okay, and now we have recombinant DNA because we have it from two sources. We have a bacterial plasmid with a human piece of DNA in that plasmid. Okay, this brings us to um, GMO foods. Genetically modified organisms are those that have had a gene from another organism inserted into their genomes. <clears throat> Therefore, they're producing a protein that's from another organism. So one of the most popular GMO foods today is called BT. Okay, so let's say BT corn. And BT stands for Bacillus thuringiensis. And that's another, that's a soil bacteria. 
And why would they do this 